section two of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson preface part two paul lawrence dunbar stands out as the first poet from the negro race in the united states to show a combined mastery over poetic material and poetic technique to reveal innate literary distinction in what he wrote and to maintain a high level of performance he was the first to rise to a height from which he could take a perspective view of his own race he was the first to see objectively its humour its superstitions its shortcomings the first to feel sympathetically its heart wounds its yearnings its aspirations and to voice them all in a purely literary form dunbar's fame rests chiefly on his poems in negro dialect this appraisal of him is no doubt fair for in these dialect poems he not only carried his art to the highest point of perfection but he made a contribution to american literature unlike what any one else had made a contribution which perhaps no one else could have made of course negro dialect poetry was written before dunbar wrote most of it by white writers but the fact stands out that dunbar was the first to use it as a medium for the true interpretation of negro character and psychology and yet dialect poetry does not constitute the whole or even the bulk of dunbar's work in addition to a large number of poems of a very high order done in literary english he was the author of four novels and several volumes of short stories indeed dunbar did not begin his career as a writer of dialect i may be pardoned for introducing here a bit of reminiscence my personal friendship with paul dunbar began before he had achieved recognition and continued to be close until his death when i first met him he had published a thin volume oak and ivy which was being sold chiefly through his own efforts oak and ivy showed no distinctive negro influence but rather the influence of james whitcomb riley at this time paul and i were together every day for several months he talked to me a great deal about his hopes and ambitions in these talks he revealed that he had reached a realization of the possibilities of poetry in the dialect together with a recognition of the fact that it offered the surest way by which he could get a hearing often he said to me i've got to write dialect poetry it's the only way i can get them to listen to me i was with dunbar at the beginning of what proved to be his last illness he said to me then i have not grown i am writing the same things i wrote ten years ago and am writing them no better his self-accusation was not fully true he had grown and he had gained a sure control of his art but he had not accomplished the greater things of which he was constantly dreaming the public had held him to the things for which it had accorded him recognition if dunbar had lived he would have achieved some of those dreams but even while he talked so dejectedly to me he seemed to feel that he was not to live he died when he was only thirty-three it has a bearing on this entire subject to note that dunbar was of unmixed negro blood so as the greatest figure in literature which the colored race in the united states has produced he stands as an example at once refuting and confounding those who wish to believe 
that whatever extraordinary ability the afro-americans shows is due to an admixture of white blood as a man dunbar was kind and tender in conversation he was brilliant and polished his voice was his chief charm and was a great element in his success as a reader of his own works in his actions he was impulsive as a child sometimes even erratic indeed his intimate friends almost looked upon him as a spoiled boy he was always delicate in health temperamentally he belonged to that class of poets who taine says are vessels too weak to contain the spirit of poetry the poets whom poetry kills the byrons the burnses the de Mousses, the poes to whom may he be compared this boy who scribbled his early verses while he ran an elevator whose youth was a battle against poverty and who in spite of almost insurmountable obstacles rose to success a comparison between him and burns is not unfitting the similarity between many phases of their lives is remarkable and their works are not incommensurable burns took the strong dialect of his people and made it classic dunbar took the humble speech of his people and in it wrought music mention of dunbar brings up for consideration the fact that although he is the most outstanding figure in literature among the afro-americans of the united states he does not stand alone among the afro-americans of the whole western world there are placido and manzano in cuba lear and durand in haiti machado de assi in brazil leon lavio in martinique and others still that might be mentioned who stand on a plane with or even above dunbar placido and machado de assi rank as great in the literatures of their respective countries without any qualifications whatever they are world figures in the literature of the latin languages machado de assi is somewhat handicapped in this respect by having as his tongue and medium the lesser-known portuguese but placido writing in the language of spain mexico cuba and of almost the whole of south america is universally known his works have been republished in the original in spain mexico and in most of the latin american countries several editions have been published in the united states translations of his works have been made into french and german placido is in some respects the greatest of all the cuban poets in sheer genius and the fire of inspiration he surpasses even the more finished heredia then too his birth his life and his death ideally contain the tragic elements that go into the making of a halo about a poet's head placido was born in habana in eighteen hundred and nine the first months of his life were passed in a foundling asylum indeed his real name gabriel de la concepcion valdez was in honor of its founder his father took him out of the asylum but shortly afterwards went to mexico and died there his early life was a struggle against poverty his youth and manhood was a struggle for cuban independence his death placed him in the list of cuban martyrs on the twenty seventh of june eighteen forty four he was lined up against a wall with ten others and shot by order of the spanish authorities on a charge of conspiracy in his short but eventful life he turned out work which bulks more than six hundred pages during the few hours preceding his execution he wrote three of his best-known poems among them his famous sonnet mother farewell placido's sonnet to his mother has been translated into every important language william cullen bryant did it in english but in spite of its wide popularity it is perhaps outside of cuba the least understood 
of all placido's poems it is curious to note how bryant's translation totally misses the intimate sense of the delicate subtlety of the poem the american poet makes it a tender and loving farewell of a son who is about to die to a heartbroken mother but that is not the kind of a farewell that placido intended to write or did write the key to the poem is in the first word and the first word is the spanish conjunction si if the central idea then of the sonnet is if the sad fate which now overwhelms me should bring a pang to your heart do not weep for i die a glorious death and sound the last note of my lyre to you bryant either failed to understand or ignored the opening word if because he was not familiar with the poet's history while placido's father was a negro his mother was a spanish white woman a dancer in one of the habana theatres at his birth she abandoned him to a foundling asylum and perhaps never saw him again although it is known that she outlived her son when the poet came down to his last hours he remembered that somewhere there lived a woman who was his mother that although she had heartlessly abandoned him that although he owed her no filial duty still she might perhaps on hearing of his sad end feel some pang of grief or sadness so he tells her in his last words that he dies happy and bids her not to weep this he does with nobility and dignity but absolutely without affection taking into account these facts and especially their humiliating and embittering effect upon a soul so sensitive as placido's this sonnet in spite of the obvious weakness of the sestet as compared with the octave is a remarkable piece of work in considering the afro-american poets of the latin languages i am impelled to think that as up to this time the colored poets of greater universality have come out of the latin american countries rather than out of the united states they will continue to do so for a good many years the reason for this i hinted at in the first part of this preface the colored poet in the united states labors within limitations which he cannot easily pass over he is always on the defensive or the offensive the pressure upon him to be propagandic is well nigh irresistible these conditions are suffocating to breadth and to real art in poetry in addition he labors under the handicap of finding culture not entirely colorless in the united states on the other hand the colored poet of latin america can voice the national spirit without any reservations and he will be rewarded without any reservations whether it be to place him among the great or declare him the greatest so i think it probable that the first world acknowledged afro-american poet will come out of latin america over against this probability of course is the great advantage possessed by the colored poet in the united states of writing in the world conquering english language this preface has gone far beyond what i had in mind when i started it was my intention to gather together the best verses i could find by negro poets and present them with a bare word of introduction it was not my plan to make this collection inclusive nor to make the book in any sense a book of criticism i planned to present only verses by contemporary writers but perhaps because this is the first collection of its kind i realized the absence of a starting point and was led to provide one and to fill in with historical data what i feel to be a gap it may be surprising to many to see how little of the poetry being written by negro poets to-day is being written in negro dialect the newer negro poets show a tendency to discard dialect much of the subject matter which went into the making of traditional dialect poetry 
possums watermelons etc they have discarded altogether at least as poetic material this tendency will no doubt be regretted by the majority of white readers and indeed it would be a distinct loss if the american negro poets threw away this quaint and musical folk speech as a medium of expression and yet after all these poets are working through a problem not realized by the reader and perhaps by many of these poets themselves not realized consciously they are trying to break away from not negro dialect itself but the limitations on negro dialect imposed by the fixing effects of long convention the negro in the united states has achieved or been placed in a certain artistic niche when he is thought of artistically it is as a happy-go-lucky singing shuffling banjo-picking being or as a more or less pathetic figure the picture of him is in a log cabin amid fields of cotton or along the levees negro dialect is naturally and by long association the exact instrument for voicing this phase of negro life and by that very exactness it is an instrument with but two full stops humour and pathos so even when he confines himself to purely racial themes the afro-american poet realizes that there are phases of negro life in the united states which cannot be treated in the dialect either adequately or artistically take for example the phases rising out of life in harlem that most wonderful negro city in the world i do not deny that a negro in a log cabin is more picturesque than a negro in a harlem flat but the negro in the harlem flat is here and he is but part of a group growing everywhere in the country a group whose ideals are becoming increasingly more vital than those of the traditionally artistic group even if its members are less picturesque what the colored poet in the united states needs to do is something like what singe did for the irish he needs to find a form that will express the racial spirit by symbols from within rather than by symbols from without such as the mere mutilation of english spelling and pronunciation he needs a form that is freer and larger than dialect but which will still hold the racial flavor a form expressing the imagery the idioms the peculiar turns of thought and the distinctive humor and pathos too of the negro but which will also be capable of voicing the deepest and highest emotions and aspirations and allow of the widest range of subjects and the widest scope of treatment negro dialect is at present a medium that is not capable of giving expression to the varied conditions of negro life in america and much less is it capable of giving the fullest interpretation of negro character and psychology this is no indictment against the dialect as dialect but against the mould of convention in which negro dialect in the united states has been set in time these conventions may become lost and the colored poet in the united states may sit down to write in dialect without feeling that his first line will put the general reader in a frame of mind which demands that the poem be humorous or pathetic in the meantime there is no reason why these poets should not continue to do the beautiful things that can be done and done best in the dialect in stating the need for afro-american poets in the united states to work out a new and distinctive form of expression i do not wish to be understood to hold any theory that they should limit themselves to negro poetry to racial themes the sooner they are able to write american poetry spontaneously the better nevertheless i believe that the richest contribution the negro poet can make to the american literature of the future will be the fusion into it of his own individual artistic gifts not many of the writers here included except dunbar are known at all to the general reading public 
and there is only one of these who has a widely recognized position in the american literary world he is william stanley braithwaite mr braithwaite is not only unique in this respect but he stands unique among all the afro-american writers the united states has yet produced he has gained his place taking as the standard and measure for his work the identical standard and measure applied to american writers and american literature he is asked for no allowances or rewards either directly or indirectly on account of his race mr braithwaite is the author of two volumes of verses lyrics of delicate and tenuous beauty in his more recent and uncollected poems he shows himself more and more decidedly the mystic but his place in american literature is due more to his work as a critic and anthologist than to his work as a poet there is still another role he has played that of friend of poetry and poets it is a recognized fact that in the work which preceded the present revival of poetry in the united states no one rendered more unremitting and valuable service than mr braithwaite and it can be said that no future study of american poetry of this age can be made without reference to braithwaite two authors included in the book are better known for their work in prose than in poetry w e b du bois whose well-known prose at its best is however impassioned and rhythmical and benjamin brawley who is the author among other works of one of the best handbooks on the english drama that has yet appeared in america but the group of the new negro poets whose work makes up the bulk of this anthology contains names destined to be known claude mckay although still quite a young man has already demonstrated his power breadth and skill as a poet mr mckay's breadth is as essential a part of his equipment as his power and skill he demonstrates mastery of the three when as a negro poet he pours out the bitterness and rebellion in his heart in those two sonnet tragedies if we must die and to the white fiends in a manner that strikes terror and when as a cosmic poet he creates the atmosphere and mood of poetic beauty in the absolute as he does in spring in new hampshire and the harlem dancer mr mckay gives evidence that he has passed beyond the danger which threatens many of the new negro poets the danger of allowing the purely polemical phases of the race problem to choke their sense of artistry mr mckay's earliest work is unknown in this country it consists of poems written and published in his native jamaica i was fortunate enough to run across this first volume and i could not refrain from reproducing here one of the poems written in the west indian negro dialect i have done this not only to illustrate the widest range of the poet's talent and to offer a comparison between the american and the west indian dialects but on account of the intrinsic worth of the poem itself i was much tempted to introduce several more in spite of the fact that they might require a glossary because however greater work mr mckay may do he can never do anything more touching and charming than these poems in the jamaica dialect fenton johnson is a young poet of the ultra modern school who gives promise of greater work than he has yet done jessie fawcett shows that she possesses the lyric gift and she works with care and finish miss fawcett is especially adept in her translations from the french georgia douglas johnson is a poet neither afraid nor ashamed of her emotions she limits herself to the purely conventional forms rhythms and rhymes but through them she achieves striking effects the principal theme of mrs johnson's poems is the secret dread down in every woman's heart the dread of the passing of youth and beauty and with them love an old theme one which poets themselves have often wearied of but which like death 
remains one of the imperishable themes on which is made the poetry that has moved men's hearts through all ages in her ingenuously wrought verses through sheer simplicity and spontaneousness mrs johnson often sounds a note of pathos or passion that will not fail to waken a response except in those too sophisticated or cynical to respond to natural impulses of the half-dozen or so of coloured women writing creditable verse and spencer is the most modern and least obvious in her methods her lines are at times involved and turgid and almost cryptic but she shows an originality which does not depend upon eccentricities in her before the feast of shushan she displays an opulence the love of which has long been charged against the negro as one of his naive and childish traits but which in art may infuse a much-needed colour warmth and spirit of abandon into american poetry john w holloway more than any negro poet writing in the dialect to-day summons to his work the lilt the spontaneity and charm of which dunbar was the supreme master whenever he employed that medium it is well to say a word here about the dialect poems of james edwin campbell in dialect campbell was a precursor of dunbar a comparison of his idioms and phonetics with those of dunbar reveals great differences dunbar is a shade or two more sophisticated and his phonetics approach nearer to a mean standard of the dialect spoken in the different sections campbell is more primitive and his phonetics are those of the dialect as spoken by the negroes of the sea islands off the coasts of south carolina and georgia which to this day remains comparatively close to its african roots and is strikingly similar to the speech of the uneducated negroes of the west indies an error that confuses many persons in reading or understanding negro dialect is the idea that it is uniform an ignorant negro of the uplands of georgia would have almost as much difficulty in understanding an ignorant sea island negro as an englishman would have not even in the dialect of any particular section is a given word always pronounced in precisely the same way its pronunciation depends upon the preceding and following sounds sometimes the combination permits of a liaison so close that to the uninitiated the sound of the word is almost completely lost the constant effort in negro dialect is to elide all troublesome consonants and sounds this negative effort may be after all only positive laziness of the vocal organs but the result is a softening and smoothing which makes negro dialect so delightfully easy for singers daniel webster davis wrote dialect poetry at the time when dunbar was writing he gained great popularity but it did not spread beyond his own race davis had unctuous humour but he was crude for illustration note the vast stretch between his hog meat and dunbar's window cone pones hot both of them poems on the traditional ecstasy of the negro in contemplation of good things to eat it is regrettable that two of the most gifted writers included were cut off so early in life r c jameson and joseph s cotter jr died several years ago both of them in their youth jameson was barely thirty at the time of his death but among his poems there is one at least which stamps him as a poet of superior talent and lofty inspiration the negro soldiers is a poem with the race problem as its theme yet it transcends the limits of race and rises to a spiritual height that makes it one of the noblest poems of the great war cotter died a mere boy of twenty and the latter part of that brief period he passed in an invalid state some months before his death he published a thin volume of verses which were for the most part written on a sick-bed in this little volume cotter showed fine poetic sense and a free and bold mastery over his material a reading of cotter's poems is certain to induce that mood in which one will regretfully speculate on what the young poet might have accomplished had he not been cut off so soon as intimated above my original idea for this book underwent a change 
in the writing of the introduction i first planned to select twenty-five to thirty poems which i judged to be up to a certain standard and offer them with a few words of introduction and without comment in the collection as it grew to be that certain standard had been broadened if not lowered but i believe that this is offset by the advantage of the wider range given the reader and the student of the subject i offer this collection without making apology or asking allowance i feel confident that the reader will find not only an earnest for the future but actual achievement the reader cannot but be impressed by the distance already covered it is a long way from the plaints of george horton to the invectives of claude mckay from the obviousness of francis harper to the complexness of ann spencer much ground has been covered but more will yet be covered it is this side of prophecy to declare that the undeniable creative genius of the negro is destined to make a distinctive and valuable contribution to american poetry i wish to extend my thanks to mr arthur a schomburg who placed his valuable collection of books by negro authors at my disposal i wish also to acknowledge with thanks the kindness of dodd mead and company for permitting the reprint of poems by paul lawrence dunbar of the cornhill publishing company for permission to reprint poems of georgia douglas johnson joseph s cotter jr bertram johnson and waverley carmichael and of neal and company for permission to reprint poems of john w holloway i wish to thank mr braithwaite for permission to use the included poems from his forthcoming volume sandy star and willie g and to acknowledge the courtesy of the following magazines the crisis the century magazine the liberator the free man the independent others and poetry a magazine of verse james weldon johnson new york city nineteen twenty one end of section two